we had a projector, but we didn't have enough candles, and it, it wasn't bright enough. So he saved our bacon. Thank you very much, John. Boy. Well, uh, good morning and welcome, and I really admire you all for coming out here. We have a four-wheel drive, so we could have gotten here regardless of how much snow there was, but uh, I didn't know how many other people would have to cancel. Um, I was afraid the only people that would show up would be the people I owe money to, to make sure, <laughs> to make sure I'm still healthy enough to, uh, to deliver, but uh, I don't think I owe money to any of you uh, as, of, as of yet. Um, I'm, uh, as Alan said, I'm a retired professor of sociology. Uh, I'm an amateur historian. I'm specifically interested in the history of uh, firearms uh, technology, and I'm afraid that's the uh, hook that got me involved in this, as we'll see it in a little bit. Um, this topic is kind of like a Christmas tree uh, that you decorate with bits of knowledge that you pick up. Um, I talked, uh, I am a program director for the Five Mile House uh, Foundation, their summer program series. Every summer we have eight weekends, every other weekend starting Memorial Day going through Labor Day. Uh, every other weekend we have a Sunday afternoon program with music and crafts and a presentation of some kind, and I'm in charge of uh, arranging those programs. And I found a, a seemingly a limited, limited, unlimited number of local history topics that I was able to develop myself or find other people to, uh, to develop. And uh, the topic of Cynthia Ann Parker came on my radar several years ago when I was talking with uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth Eisnagel, who is in the genealogy department, a genealogy society, and she said she was interested in Cynthia Ann, and I had her do a program at, at Five Mile House on the topic. And then a wonderful lady who unfortunately has gone to her greater reward within the last couple of weeks, uh, Glennie Hamill of Mattoon, uh, put me onto a book that I highly recommend if, you, if there's just one book on the topic that you might, that you should know about, and probably most of you do know about it, uh, a book uh, by uh, S.C. Gwynn called Empire of the Summer Moon. Uh, this is the most wonderful piece of literature on the topic that I found, and Glennie Hamill uh, put me onto it. And as a result of that, I developed a topic about Quanta Parker and the Buffalo Hunters several years ago. And uh, Professor uh, Hildebrandt came to that uh, program and afterwards told me that uh, she was developing a program on Quanta Parker in a couple of years. And I, I think I volunteered and said, hey, I'd like to be part of that. <laughs> and I thought two years ago, I'm ready. I don't need to do any more studying. Uh, it's like my Christmas tree is decorated. I've got all the information I need. Well, I've been uh, finding more and more books. Uh, your program book has a wonderful list of uh, uh, references on the, on the topic in its various dimensions that uh, the library put together. And I must, uh, looked through that and found some more titles and went on Amazon and found cheap copies uh, secondhand and started buying additional titles about Quanta Parker and Cynthia Ann and the whole era. And so. On the, uh, <laughs> By the way, this, uh, this book, uh, Empire of the Summer Moon, is available secondhand on Amazon for 2 or $3. Of course, there's a $4 shipping charge, but it's really, <laughs> it's, it's really an incredible piece of, uh, of literature, and I'm really kind of doing a book report, so to speak. Oh, yes, the libraries have it. Uh, Beth, uh, it is available here. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Well, um, that's true. <laughs> Although the cost of gas from your house to here and back might be about equivalent to that. Um, and I found, well, one of the other books that I found more recently uh, is a book entitled The Last Comanche Chief by Bill Neely. Now, this, this book was written 18, or 1985, 1995, I believe, but it has a wonderful uh, summary of uh, the life of the subject of our topic today. But there are lots of others out there, and <clears throat> some have been mentioned already in the presentations and will probably be uh, additionally mentioned in the uh, follow-up presentations. So uh, my Christmas tree has many more ornaments on it than it did two years ago, and 
I was still adding things this morning when I got up. So I, anyway, and this may be a TMI session for you all. Too much information. I picked up all these factoids, and it's hard for me to resist uh, sharing them or Im imposing them upon you. I watched my wife, though. Uh, she has a set of hand signals, <laughs> kind of like a, a, a gang symbols, you know, it's to uh, <laughs> tell me to speed up or stop doing that or keep your eyes open or whatever. So unfortunately, the... Uh, Video camera can't pick all of that up because that's truly rich. Well, <laughs> Quanta Parker and the Battle of Adobe Walls. Why would we spend uh, a session, a uh, fewer minutes than we've had, though, uh, on a singular historical event in Texas? And uh, we have a friend who lived in Texas all of her life in her childhood. And when I showed her the program, she said she'd never heard of Adobe Walls. And I thought that Texas uh, school children were pretty well uh, exposed to uh, important facts in Texas history, but apparently Adobe Walls is not considered one of the, uh, one of the uh, noticeable events. I may be wrong. I ought to look at a uh, Texas school uh, curriculum to see if it's included there. Um, I want to deal with the backstory of uh, the event we're going to talk about today. And uh, the, the word uh, common chariot refers to, is a term that refers to an area in uh, five different states. And you can see on the map here, uh, circumscribed by this dotted line, that was an area that was dominated by the um, Comanche Indians and other groups uh, associated with them, associated meaning living in the same area and uh, following the same way of life. This is an area of the horse Indians. Uh, as they are called here in uh, American history. The Comanches and other tribes adopted the horse uh, after it uh, was released by the Spaniards and multiplied in wild, uh, wild herds. And the Comanches uh, became the most skillful horsemen of the plains, uh, acknowledged by all those who comment on this. I've never seen any, any challenge to that, uh, to that label. Uh, the, the Comanches supposedly began in south, uh, western, southeastern Colorado, up there in the corner of what we, you see in the diagram. But uh, with the horse, now this, was an, this is a Stone Age culture, but with the horse they became incredibly mobile. It's like giving a, a bunch of little boys uh, mountain bikes and putting them on a big open parking lot. They're going to go any place, every place, all the time. Uh, the horse made... Uh, a completely new way of life possible for the, uh, for the Comanches. They could range completely over this area, which they did, uh, hunting buffalo, uh, stealing horses from anyone, uh, especially in northern Mexico, that uh, had them uh, poorly guarded. Uh, they would, uh, in another map we're going to look at in a bit, there are a couple of um, lines showing what are called Comanche traces, which were historic Comanche trails that uh, led them from South Texas into Mexico. Uh, the Comanches became completely familiar with this area, uh, knowing where the water holes were, uh, uh, where the river crossings were that were safe. Um, they became totally familiar with uh, the central plains of Texas. I've not been to Texas but a couple times. Uh, this map does not show the uh, geography or the, uh, the geological formations of Texas. Along the western border of Texas with New Mexico is a elevated plain called the... Ah, yes. Um, along here is an elevated plain called the uh, Llano Escudado. My Spanish is awful. I had my daughter help me pronounce that. But it's... Uh, a land that was uh, well understood by the Comanches because of their explorations, but the white settlers stayed away from it. The white settlers were afraid of it, and it was a place of refuge for uh, the Comanches when they were engaged in their conflicts with uh, the white community. Anyway, uh, the lords of the plains, horses, buffalo, raids, uh, kidnappings uh, to extract ransom, were the elements of the Comanche culture. Uh, Gwynn calls the Comanche culture a very stripped down culture. They had 
very little in the way of religious rites. They didn't uh, make pottery. They didn't weave baskets. Uh, they didn't engage in the sun dance. <laughs> they basically uh, fought and hunted buffalo and procreated and um, took care of their horse herds. And that is, uh, again, probably the simplest uh, cultural uh, array in any of the uh, other uh, Plains Indians. We had the, you know, the Cheyennes and the Arapahoes and the Kiowas. Oh, when the Comanches got the horse, one of the first things they did was to drive the Apaches out of this area that we call Comancheria. Before Comancheria, it had the name of uh, Apacheria, meaning an area that was dominated by the Apaches. Uh, the Apaches, which we tend to think of as fierce, you know, Geronimo and all that, uh, the Apaches were either exterminated or driven down into uh, northern Mexico. And by the way, our sensitivities, our sensibilities here have to be put on, I don't know, hold or pause or whatever, because the aboriginal cultures, uh, the Stone Age cultures we're talking about, uh, were deadly in their inner, uh, inner group uh, uh, contacts. When one group attacked another, uh, the losers were killed. Um, sometimes the children of a group that was attacked would be, would be uh, adopted, but all the males were killed. Uh, the women were typically raped and killed. Um, children of certain ages were also dispatched. The ones that weren't killed were, were taken back to the, uh, let's say the Comanches, taken back to their villages and made essentially slaves. Uh, to help the uh, Comanche women process the buffalo products that were harvested by their contact with the uh, bison on, uh, I'm going to call them buffalo. That term seems to be uh, easier to say than bison, although I think it's got more syllables. But uh, in Comanche culture, the men fought and uh, hunted, and the women processed the buffalo products. It was a truly unequal society. Okay, well. The Comanches uh, and their associated uh, groups, uh, the Arapahoes and Kiowas and uh, uh, Cheyennes, they uh, dominated this area until about 1830 when uh, the white settlements from the east began uh, pressing on that uh, eastern frontier there that we see that line. Oh, by the way, I should say something uh, before this. The, the uh, Comanches served as a stopper, as a plug. <laughs> uh, the Comanches kept the Mexican community from moving to the north in settlement, and they kept the uh, French-American community from Louisiana moving east. They essentially blocked the settlement of these plains by their uh, high mobility and their willingness to attack those who intruded. Now, they did conduct, they did conduct trading uh, sessions. Um, the, ah, uh, yes, I got, I've got a light here, don't I? Um, the group called the Comancheros were, half, were mixed breed uh, Indian and uh, often Spanish that, that would come from New Mexico and, and come across that uh, that plain area or that, uh, that elevated area here. And there were, were designated spots where the Indians and the Camancheros would, uh, would trade. The Camancheros would bring uh, trade goods, uh, firearms and ammunition and possibly things like, like sugar and tobacco. And, uh, and the Comanches would bring their horses. Horses were a very saleable product, a very tradable product here in the uh, in the uh, Central Plains. Okay. Well, let's go to the next uh, the next slide. Now we enter uh, now enter the Parkers um, into the, our story. Um, we've already heard the Parkers came to Texas in 1833, and here is the location of the Parker Fort um, that they built and. The next picture, I believe, shows the modern reconstruction of that. You can see that today. Uh, uh, we have some Parker uh, family members here. Have any of you attended the Parker reunions in Texas? Okay. 
I wish someone would have descri would describe those for us sometime because I, I guess they take place every year. Yes, they, they, they have it every year. At a particular time, uh, some anniversary date in the. Uh, They're usually in the summertime. I don't know if it's. There might be an anniversary. Is it held here at the Parker Fort, or it's other? Held at the, it's held at the uh, Parker State Park. Okay. You have you have visited the fort though. Yes, yes. Does that look like the way it looks today, pretty much? Yes. Uh, there are some better pictures, but I haven't uh, haven't found. Them. Yes, sir. I think it's the third Friday in July. Third Friday in July. Is that again some anniversary date for some important? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Well, again, this is the Parker Fort uh, that was established, and it turned out it was established rather far west into the Indian Territory, and that's probably why the, uh, that large Comanche group uh, visited it in 1836 and uh, did its depredations that took uh, Cynthia Ann and her brother and the others hostage, uh, beginning uh, Cynthia Ann's uh, captivity. Well. We've heard the story of uh, Cynthia Ann after her captivity. Uh, she was with a Comanche group. She apparently adopted, adapted very well and became the wife of a Comanche war chief, uh, Peta Nakona, and bore three children to this uh, gentleman. I shouldn't, should I call him a gentleman because he was a, you know, when soldiers come back from a war a climate, they typically don't want to talk about what happened there. And I think the, Activities that occurred on these raids are that kind of uh, are that kind of topic. Um, Quanah Parker himself, I want to get to Quana Parker himself, confessed or reported of various uh, deaths he caused in his uh, warring with the with the white uh, community. Anyway, Cynthia Ann married uh, Pat Nakona, had three children. Uh, there were several contacts. Uh, by white traders with the Comanche groups holding her or, or with whom she lived, attempts to get her back, attempts to convince her to come back. And she, at first, when she was younger, uh, her um, family, her Comanche family rejected the offers. And when she was older, she rejected them herself. She had three children, uh, Kwana and uh, Pecos and... Um, her daughter's name is Prairie Flower, that's right. Topsana. Pardon? Topsana. Right. I never can seem to recall that. <laughs> that. As I okay, let's go on to uh, the next uh, picture. Here is a, here is the picture of uh, that was taken of her with uh, Prairie Flower Topsana shortly after her uh, shortly after her uh, repatriation. Supposedly, I saw the date on this picture, uh, 1861. But anyway. Uh, Cynthia Ann rejoined the white community uh, after the Battle of Pease River in 1860. Uh, a Texas Ranger company and some Texas militia uh, volunteers supposedly found a hunting camp that Cynthia Ann happened to be in. They attacked it. Uh, they didn't know who was there. They attacked it and basically killed a number of the women. Um, the next picture shows the leader of that group, Saul Ross, uh, Sullivan Ross. He made a career out of, um, of, out of elaborating on the event. He claimed not only did he find and recover Cynthia Ann Parker, but that he also killed her husband, Petta Nakona. Uh, he made that statement, uh, he made that claim in, in writings, um, and in fact probably generated maybe just the uh, recapture of Cynthia Ann was enough, but he parlayed his uh, re reputation of that event into eventually the governorship, I believe, of Texas. Anyway, Quanah Parker claims, though, that his father, Petter Nakona, was not present at the, the raid that captured Cynthia Ann and Prairie Flower, that uh, his father and he were off on a hunting expedition, and that his father uh, 
lived on after his, he lost his wife, lived on for several years, eventually succumbing to uh, wounds that he had suffered long ago in, uh, in uh, battles with, with the Apaches. Um, Cynthia Ann's life with her uh, repatriated uh, family, uh, when she was repatri repatriated to her family, was not a happy, happy time. She, according to the reports, attempted to return whenever she had a chance, and they essentially restrained her. Um, one thing, one uh, book I read claims that some of her relatives claimed that when the time was right, they would help her go back and visit her uh, Comanche family, but that time never came. Her daughter, uh, Prairie Flower, seemed to adopt, uh, adapt to uh, the white culture very quickly, uh, was quickly learning English, seemed to be very happy as a young, uh, a young child. But she died of influenza in 1864, four years after they were repatriated. And I've had conflicting dates. Uh, I've seen dates that claim that, uh, that Cynthia Ann only lived a year or so after that. But uh, the official date of her death seems to be 1870, which is like six years after her daughter died. Anyway, uh, Cynthia Ann lived on for an indeterminate time. I, I like that uh, date of, of 1870, uh, really. And when uh, Quanah Parker, at the end of his life, had uh, Cynthia's grave moved to uh, its last location, he had a uh, death date of 1870, I believe, inscribed on that. So that seemed to be the date that he believed. Well, let's go on to the next picture. Okay, buffalo hunting. Um, before I get into this, let me say that Quana, after his uh, father's, after his mother's uh, recapture or repatriation, he was 12 at the time. Uh, he spent the next decade becoming a charismatic uh, leader in the community in the community of Comanches. He seemed to show natural uh, leadership ability. Uh, among Comanches, a leader had to uh, have charisma, which is a, a trait you can't really learn. It's there or it isn't. And if it's there, it, it makes you a very influential uh, person uh, among your peers. And he had it. And first of all, physically, he was a um, more statuesque uh, uh, member of the, of the community. I think his height was uh, registered at between 5 feet 10 and 6 feet uh, Cynthia Ann was supposedly five feet six, about 140 pounds. She was quite large, very large compared to other Comanche women. And Quanah Parker's stature made him a uh, virtual giant, a very large man among the, uh, his uh, Comanche uh, associates. I think a, a typical Comanche male might be five foot four, five foot five, five foot six, which is quite short. Very compact, very well adapted to horseback uh, maneuvering. But uh, anyway. Quana became a natural leader in his young uh, life after he was separated from his mother. Um, he was uh, present, well, after his mother, 1860, we have the Civil War, and all federal troops were withdrawn from Texas and all uh, uh, to fight the war, and Texas was basically an undef undefended, unpatrolled uh, frontier during the war years. And the uh, Native Americans got very frisky, more frisky than they had been. And uh, the raids and attempts to push back the white settlement um, rose to a, 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 a previous a pitch that it had slightly cooled off before the war. The war ended in 1867. The federal government tried to uh, settle the Indians down by negotiating what is called the, the Treaty of Medicine Lodge. In 1867, some treaties were uh, offered and negotiated between uh, the United States and Southern Plains Indian tribes, which uh, was asking them to retire to reservations and receive various commodities and uh, 300 acre, 320 acres per Indian family in exchange for ceasing their raiding. The uh, treaties were drafted. The treaties were offered. Uh, some of the uh, 
Plains Indian group signed on and went to the uh, reservations, but many others didn't. Quanta Parker, to the end of his life, could report that he and his Indian groups never lost a battle, never signed a treaty, and when he eventually went to the reservation, it was a, um, a voluntary, well, a voluntary thing on his part. He could have remained off, but uh, he saw the advantages to, to doing that. He was present, uh, 1867. He would have been 19 years old. Oh, yeah, he was supposedly born in 1848. There are some other dates offered, but I like that 1848 uh, date. So I'm, I'm going to uh, offer that as his birthday. Well, the buffalo harvest. Um, this is the picture painted in 1888 by uh, J.H. Moser. It's a painting that's it's on display in St. Louis in a, in a um, museum there, the, the Museum of Westward Expansion. I'm not sure of its exact title, but it's there. Is it? Okay, then it, and that's where the, the painting is at the last time it was reported. Um, this painting is called uh, The Still Hunt. Um, the American bison was hunted by the Indians basically on horseback with bows and arrows and lances. Um, and there are pictures before 1870 of um, white Americans hunting a, a buffalo riding horses up to them and shooting them down with pistols. Um, but in 1870, something happened to the, uh, to the buffalo hide business. In 1870, buffalo hides became extremely valuable as leather for use in industrial belting. A new process of tanning leather was developed about 1870, and the industrial belting um, industry took off and buffalo hides became incredibly valuable. Before 1870, a buffalo robes were saleable, buffalo meat was saleable. Um, but about 1870, with this new leather, technology, leather tanning technology, the demand for buffalo hides uh, just took off. Between 1868 and 1881, it's estimated that there were 30 million buffalo exterminated or harvested for, uh, for industrial purposes. Now the buffalo was seen as a, uh, as a natural asset. You know, uh, asset stripping is a term we use for, you know, timber that is cut, fish that are removed from waters, uh, minerals that are removed from the ground. The buffalo was a natural resource that was seen as basically unlimited. It's estimated that but, but only estimates, there was never a census taken, couldn't be. A hundred million, I mean, uh, at, at, at their height. Well, this is the picture of uh, a typical buffalo hunting uh, professional in the 1870s. He, um, the technique is developed to, with high-powered rifles, sneak up on a group of buffalo and shoot uh, the leaders. And, and buffalo apparently are immune to danger that they can't see. If, they, if one of their fellows falls over, if there's a noise and he falls over, but they can't see the source of that, uh, of that noise, they are not alarmed, they don't, they don't run off. So the technique of the buffalo hunters was to use their long range rifles and to sneak up on a group like this and look for what they consider to be the, the leaders, uh, old uh, cows perhaps, or s some particular kind of buffalo that seems to be in the lead of the group and shoot them down. And this is called uh, taking, getting a stand. Um, buffalo hunters could uh, kill within hours over 100. I mean, it's almost an unlimited number that they could kill if they could keep the group from running off. Uh, this, this, this buffalo hunter is painted by, by Moser, again, 10 years really, probably after this scene could have taken place. He has on his belt here uh, a, a sheath that, that contains skinning knives and uh, knives for dressing. Uh, here is his ammunition belt laid out on the ground, um, and he is shooting a long-range rifle 
made by the Sharps Rifle Company of Hartford, Connecticut. It was the uh, cutting edge technology for long range shooting at the time. And it figures later into the uh, story of, uh, of Adobe Walls, which I've got to get to quickly here. Um, the um, next picture is useful. Here is a picture of Buffalo Bill. Uh, Buffalo Bill came to fame before the uh, previous picture. Uh, Buffalo Bill was a hunter for the uh, railroad construction crews and made his uh, reputation by hunting uh, buffalo for meat. Uh, allegedly, he uh, reported that in his career, in 18 months, he had killed, uh, he had harvested 4,280 buffalo. Uh, there's a little, uh, a little dog roll that uh, was published uh, during his time that uh, testifies to his fame. And let me see if I can remember. Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill always aims and shoots to kill, never misses, never will. And the government pays the Buffalo Bill. Uh, I don't know how much money he made in harvesting those thousands of buffalo, but it, it made his reputation, which later, as you know, he uh, parlayed into a Wild West show and achieved a worldwide fame. Uh, the next picture shows buffalo hides that have been killed, stripped, dried, and piled up waiting for, for shipment to uh, the east. At the time of this picture, uh, Dodge City had a railhead, uh, had a, a railroad coming to it. I think it went beyond it, but the buffalo hides were harvested on the plains of Kansas and hauled to Dodge City, and they, here they are awaiting uh, shipment by rail back east to the, uh, to the leather tanning factories. Um, Buffalo hunting, besides being an industry, was also a recreation. The next picture shows an excursion train. The railroads would sell tickets to uh, people who, were, who wanted to be hauled out to uh, the Buffalo Plains, and the sportsmen, uh, quote unquote, were able to uh, pot away at Buffalo from the trains. I don't know if they if the train stopped and they went out and uh, collected any of the, any of the uh, products of their shooting, but uh, supposedly a $10 ticket from some point would give a person a, an excursion uh, experience. And you can see they're shooting from the windows, from the tops. Um, this is a picture that was, was, uh, was published in uh, Harper's or one of the national magazines in the 1870s. And the next picture shows another form of buffalo hunting. Uh, sportsmen from overseas came to hunt the American bison. Uh, this picture is of the Grand Duke Alexis, the younger son of the Russian Tsar Alexander II. Uh, he came and conducted a uh, tour of the prairies. And I think Buffalo Bill accompanied him, but the fellow there on the, on the ground is, is uh, George Armstrong Custer. Uh, Custer was a very ardent hunter and he was one of the guides of this, uh, of this gentleman. I think this took place about 1871, 72. I don't see a date in this uh, picture, but okay, you want to go on? Okay. Well, the buffalo harvest uh, was rapidly stripping the uh, buffalo plains of, of the buffalo, and the Comanches depended, and the other Indian groups, depended on those buffalo for food. Uh, the, the, the Comanches used everything. Uh, the hides for their teepees and for clothing, uh, the meat uh, was dried and preserved. Um, the sinews in the uh, buffalo's carcass were used for bowstrings and other, other uh, purposes uh, for which we have thread. Um, the hooves could be boiled to make glue. Even the buffalo excrement, the buffalo chips, were a, a fine source of, uh, of fuel out of the prairie when there are no trees around. So the, the, the Indians used everything on the buffalo, but it's beller, and I don't know, they, maybe they had to use, maybe they found a way to, to use that sound. Well, the, um, is there another map next, next to it, Kathy? John asked, what about the buffalo wings? <laughs> that may have been the source of that. <laughs> I've been uh, unable to uh, <laughs> identify. 
Could we go to the next? Uh, there, hopefully, there's a, no, no, not. A, a, you want to go back to the previous map? Okay. Well, the uh, 1870, a new technology for for creating leather. Uh, 1871, 72, 73, the buffalo harvest was to the north of Kamancharya in on the plains of uh, Kansas, and it was very convenient to Dodge City, which was a, uh, a railhead. Um, but by 1874, the, the buffalo up here had been pretty well reduced to uh, non-profitable uh, levels of uh, harvesting, and so the buffalo hunters moved south into the Texas panhandle, and that was an area that was supposedly uh, guaranteed to the Native Americans for hunting grounds as part of that Medicine Lodge Treaty. But uh, th the thing was that um, the supplies for the buffalo hunters were very costly to, uh, to transport. And so the merchants of Dodge City arranged to have a, uh, a distant trading post set up so they would take uh, supplies down to that trading post and the buffalo hunters would be able to exchange what they harvested in, in hides there and also buy their supplies, their ammunition, um, their sugar and coffee. And, uh, and here, here is Adobe Walls. Adobe Walls was the site of the uh, trading post that was set up by the merchants in Dodge City. Uh, the trading post was, was built from the ground up starting in March of 1874. Uh, go on to the next. Here is a painting of Adobe Walls as of 1874. It was begun in, in, in March and it was supposedly, uh, the buildings were supposedly finished by June. The buildings were very primitive. They were made out of sod, wood frames with sod, uh, walls. Uh, there was one. There was one uh, picket post a building that was a, a blacksmith shop. But there were basically four buildings there: a blacksmith shop, a saloon, and two stores. And the buffalo hunters would come there and uh, receive payment for their buffalo hides and use that money to buy liquor to, and also to buy supplies to return to the buffalo uh, to the buffalo ranges. But uh, by the way, at the, at the time of uh, this. Uh, creation of adobe walls, a buffalo hide was worth about $3.50. And my wife looked up an uh, inflation calculator, and that was the equivalent of about $75 today, $75 to $100 today. So every buffalo hide that was uh, harvested and brought in would supposedly yield to the hunter that, uh, that amount. Now, a hunter, uh, the buffalo hunting process involved teams where there were there were the shooters and then there then they there were the uh, the skinners every hunter typically had to have at least one skinner and if he harvested a lot he had to have a number of skinners working for them the skinners were paid maybe 25 cents 50 cents per hide that they that they stripped off and they developed that into quite a science uh, doing it quickly and the buffalo hide would then be taken uh, to a camp and spread out fur down and staked out and, and allowed to dry. And it became uh, flint hard, really. It became stiff. And then the, the, those stiff uh, hides would be piled on wagons and brought into a post like this. Okay, my gosh, adobe walls. Well, um, this, was considered, uh, this was considered an intrusion by the Comanches. Um, and the traders heard rumors that there was going to be an attack on adobe walls. And this uh, attack was orchestrated by Quanah Parker and a medicine man by the name of Issa Tai. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that way, but uh, uh, that's another picture of adobe walls. You want to go on? The next picture shows Quanah Parker. Um, a little later than Adobe Walls, but he, he would have been uh, 27 to 26, 27 years old about this time. And the next picture shows his partner in crime. No, back up. That's Isatai. Isatai was a shaman who whipped up uh, the local Indian populations to conduct a raid into, uh, into uh, buffalo hunting territory. And he said that he could make his... Uh, 
co-conspirators bulletproof, <laughs> and therefore they could go and exterminate the buffalo hunters without uh, being harmed. I don't know if Quanta Parker uh, agreed uh, with that, but he went along with it. <clears throat> and they recruited about 250 uh, warriors, not only Comanches, but also some Cheyennes, some Arapahoes, to uh, go and take out the uh, post of adobe walls. In your brochure, I said that there were 700 Indian warriors. I think that the number 250 is a, a little uh, more accurate. Also, I have a mistaken date there, 1870, um, I, I'm sorry, ju uh, June 27, not June 26th, but anyway. Okay, well, Adobe Walls was up and running. Um, in June, the, uh, there was rumors that Isotai, that the, the Indians were, the natives were restless and they were going to attack the uh, post. Some of the traders, some of the owners of the uh, establishments there had heard these rumors and they left town, but they didn't tell anybody. I've never understood that. They did not tell anybody. Uh, the, the owner of the saloon, James Hanrahan, also had heard the rumors and he believed they were true, but he didn't want to leave his stock of liquor and other goods unprotected, so he hung around. Uh, that next picture is one of, the, one of the famous participants in the Adobe Walls fight. This is a picture of Billy Dixon. Uh, Billy Dixon is a uh, famous Western figure. Uh, he was at Adobe Walls. He was a buffalo hunter. Um, a, a month or so later, he was involved in a, um, in a fight um, where he and five others uh, withstood an attack of 150 Indians, 125 Indians for a number of days and uh, won a Congressional Medal of Honor for his bravery. But he, he was at Adobe Walls. Late in his life, he wrote a book called, uh, with his widow, uh, with his wife doing the transcribing of uh, the life of Billy Dixon and he describes what happened at Adobe Walls. And the next picture is another famous person who was present at the time. This is Bat Masterson, who became a famous lawman Ended up his life as a newspaper reporter in New York, but uh, he was also there. Well, Quanta Parker and Isate and the 250 warriors uh, came to Adobe Walls on the night of uh, June 26th. Um, they were not discovered. Um, Hanrahan, the saloon owner, knew that they were or suspected they were coming. Everyone went to sleep that night, but Hanrahan, in the middle of the night, about two o'clock in the morning, fired his rifle in his saloon with a loud noise that awakened everybody, but he said, you know what? The ridge pole of the roof is, is cracking and it's gonna collapse, we've gotta fix this. He didn't tell him he'd fired his rifle, he told him the ridge pole was cracked. And so the, there were um, a number of people, there were 28 people and a woman Women are also people, but there were 28 males and the wife of one of the, uh, one of the persons there uh, at uh, Adobe Walls when uh, the attack occurred. Maybe half of them were in that saloon sleeping on the floor. Two o'clock in the morning, the shot wakes them up. They are convinced by Hanrahan the roof needs to be repaired. And so they go up and they, the, roof is, the roof is made of sod. The walls are made of sod. There are poles and then there are sod uh, slices that are laid on top of the roof. All those sod, sod slices are taken off and the lodge or the ridge pole is uh, replaced and a prop is cut to put it in place. That repair uh, took place uh, June 27th between 2 o'clock in the morning and about 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, when the repair is finished, uh, some of the guys said going back to sleep and Hanrahan said, no, no, no. Uh, let's celebrate our successful repair and he offered free drinks to everybody. Well, shortly after four o'clock, Billy Dixon uh, claims that he went out to uh, check his wagon because he was going to leave for the bu uh, buffalo hunting range the next morning. He went out to check his wagon and to get his horse and he happened to notice the oncoming, <laughs> oncoming onslaught of Quanah Parker and the uh, Indians charging the uh, Adobe Walls buildings. And he had a rifle with him and he fired one shot, but then turned and ran quickly back into the uh, into Hanrahan's store. This is a painting that supposedly shows the Indians surrounding the uh, the buildings. 
that uh, charge of Indians uh, came up to the buildings. Uh, they surrounded the buildings and started uh, firing with small arms, with uh, pistols. And the Indians had a number of repeating carbines, but those carbines were uh, chambered for only pistol cartridges. They were not very powerful. Rapid fire was possible, but there wasn't a great deal of power. But uh, the men and the one woman inside the stores were able to barricade themselves with uh, sacks of flour, uh, sacks of grain, and apparently the doors had good bars on them because the Indians were unable to bre uh, break in. Quanta Parker later reported that he, when he was riding up to the, uh, to the store, he backed his horse into, one of the, uh, into the door of the saloon and tried to have the horse act as the battering ram to break, open the door, and it didn't work. Quanta Parker also claims that he crawled on top of one of the, uh, possibly the saloon roof, and was firing his pistol down through the uh, ceiling. But nobody inside these buildings were, were hit by, uh, by uh, bullets at the time. <clears throat> as the soldiers, as the soldiers, uh, soldiers, as the uh, Indians approached the buildings, they caught two Saddler brothers uh, who were sleeping in a wagon um, away from the building. They caught them and killed them, and also the dog. In fact, they supposedly scalped them all, including the dog. <laughs> um, in one of my reports, uh, Quanta Parker claims that he was responsible for killing with a lance, one of those Saddler brothers, but anyway. They were the only two initially killed, and later there was another man who was killed by gunfire, a man by the name of Billy Tyler. But those were the only three white casualties in this, uh, in this attack. The hunters inside the buildings, though, unlimbered, unlimbered their, uh, their buffalo guns and began f returning fire and gradually, well, gradually drove the Indians back away from the buildings and uh, were doing serious damage. There were at least 13 Indians that were killed and their bodies not recovered. The Indians made great efforts to recover anybody who was down, wounded or, or killed, but there were 13 bodies that they could not, uh, they could not recover. Well, I am in a, I'm in a real fix here because I'm, I'm just about out of time and uh, I've got to uh, wind this up. Um, Quanta Parker said that the, the attack beginning about four in the morning, it uh, lasted until about noon when the Indians were discouraged by the uh, effective return fire from the buffalo guns of the, uh, of the hunters inside. And so uh, they retreated to a far distance, a far distance, 500 yards away. But even at 500 yards, Quanta Parker had a horse shot, shot out from under him by the buffalo gun wielding hunters. And uh, as he scrambled to get away from his horse, uh, a, a bullet ricocheted off of a powder horn he was carrying and hit him in the back. It didn't really seriously injure him, but it did put him out of the fight for the, uh, the time. And uh, his uh, compatriots came and carried him away. And it seems to be a tradition in, in Indian culture, when a chief is downed or immobilized, the rest of the group loses heart and tends to retreat to a, a safer distance. Well. At the end of the first day, again, there were three white uh, hunters uh, who had been killed. There were 13 Indian bodies scattered about the, uh, uh, the premises or uh, the outside. Um, and the uh, Indians had retreated to a, what they considered safe distance, but the buffalo hunters were continuing to take pot shots at them at half a mile away, 500 yards, three quarters of a mile and occasionally would strike one of them and, uh, and lay them low. The siege uh, continued without any uh, serious uh, damage for the second day. On the third day, the legend goes that some of the um, hunters urged Billy Dixon to take a shot at a group of Indians that were about three quarters of a mile off. Billy Dixon picked up his 50 caliber um, Sharps rifle and he said, it was strictly a lucky shot, but he fired at an Indian and three quarters of a mile away, 1,500 yards and a bit, uh, the Indian was hit and fell off his horse. Now it turns out the Indian wasn't killed, but he was, he was wounded. And that shot 
seemed to finish off the demoralization of the uh, surrounding Indians, and they, and they uh, withdrew and uh, ended the Battle of Adobe Walls. Now the problem is uh, they, they left Adobe Walls, but they went on a rampage across the fr uh, frontier. In the next couple of months, the uh, Comanche uh, and uh, their allies killed 190 people uh, on the frontier in various places. The federal government uh, was fed up and conducted a, oh, what was called the Red River War. And here is a picture of the uh, troop movements that engaged in this war, there were five, there were five columns that converged on the, uh, on the stronghold of the Comanches, um, one from Fort Dodge, uh, one from, uh, <clears throat> from Fort Sill to the, uh, from east to west, uh, Fort Richardson to the north uh, west, Fort Concho in the, uh, in the south, and then another column came from Fort Union over in New Mexico. And if you go to the next picture, there is a, a, a picture of the dates and the locations of the, of the skirmishes, the battles that took place during that war. It was only about three or four months long. Uh, there were relatively few casualties, but what the armies did was to seek out and find Indian villages and destroy the villages. They would destroy the teepees, they would, uh, they would capture and carry off and destroy the horses, they would destroy the personal property, uh, the stored foodstuffs. And all of that in the rest of 1874 did a great deal to discourage the Indians and cause them to uh, go to the reservations voluntarily. Quanta Parker's group was the last group to, uh, to retire from the field. Quanta Parker's group did not uh, go into the reservation until 1875, uh, starting in May. They ended up, I think, June 1st or 2nd, they came to Fort Sill, Quanta Parker's group. You want to go to the next picture? And uh, this is the picture we started out with. That shaded area, that shaded area here is the reservation that was provided for the, for the Comanches and the Kiowas when they uh, left the war trail. That's, uh, that represents about two million acres. And it's that area that Quanta Parker made his reputation on later uh, in his life, uh, leasing grazing rights and looking out for the uh, interests of his, uh, of his uh, tribe, uh, tribal uh, members. Um, we have a series of pictures of Quanta Parker. Uh, there's uh, Quanta Parker with his wife. Quanta Parker had in his lifetime a total of eight wives. Uh, the first one uh, was an Apache lady who uh, said she couldn't learn the, uh, uh, the Comanche language and arranged to go back home. but. Throughout the rest of his life, he accumulated seven wives, and I think he had 25 children. He had several adopted children. Uh, if you want to go on to the... Uh, here is a house that he arranged, that he organized to be built for himself with private funds uh, in about 1890. Uh, there about... Uh, the private funds came from cattlemen. Uh, he, he applied for a government grant, but the uh, government officials who were uh, in charge of granting or denying said that his polygamy was a, um, a deal breaker. That he, if he would give up his wives, they would find some money for him. And he said, no way, and uh, found private funds. This is called Star House. It's still in existence. It's in, it's in sad shape, uh, seeking a benefactor to help restore it. But uh, 10 rooms, uh, two stories. Uh, the stars on top supposedly signify, in his mind, his rank. More stars than the highest uh, general of the uh, U.S. Army, uh, a house that he used to entertain elaborately, lavishly. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt came to that house, um, all kinds of dignitaries. Many of his former uh, adversaries came to visit him later in life. Again, he was only 27 when he came to the reservation, and uh, the rest of his life was spent on the white man's road doing good things for his people and making, continuing to make a name for himself. He lived until 1911. Um, I think he was 59 years old uh, by our calculation. And by that time, he managed to have his mother's remains and his sister's remains moved to, uh, is it Fort Sill? Um, and he is buried uh, 
at the same place. Here's a picture taken in 1908 of Quanah there in the, uh, in the center with, uh, I counted there were 20 people in this, um, in this picture, but his wives, his children, uh, some of his uh, in-law, some of his uh, son-in-laws. Well, we can't do this. I was going to say, if you think about all the people we've talked about, and you can sit and talk with any of them for an hour, who would you choose? But we can't do that thing, so uh, think about it, though. Uh, I have quite a list of people I would like to revisit in this, uh, in this trip. Well, we've got to go. We've got another wonderful program coming on, so um, thank you all for staying awake. And uh, I'll uh, turn the podium over to our next speaker.